So yes, uh, my name is Alex Hill. I'm from the University of Illinois. Um, and this project was also done in collaboration with uh, Dan Gothier and his student, uh, Joe Zabo, at Ohio State University. Um, so what we are working on is trying to establish a secure QKD link by distributing uh, single photons between drones flying in the air. So aside from being um, sort of current and uh, a fun novelty, why would you actually want to do something like this? So one big issue if you're trying to do any sort of free space communication uh, horizontally through the air along the Earth's surface is that turbulence scales much more poorly than if you're trying to do an up or down link because the density of air remains roughly constant along the path. Um, however, if you can raise your path even a little bit, you get um, an order of magnitude or two improvement in the turbulence that you experience. Um, so you might imagine uh, you have two points in space that you're trying to uh, establish a secure link between, and you raise some drones above a turbulent or fog or weather layer, and you begin uh, transmitting a key between the two, and then you bring your drones down, and then you do your standard, standard uh, encryption uh, between the two nodes you're trying to secure. Um, so the, uh, this requires you to load your whole system uh, onto the drone payload, um, but also it allows you to uh, establish a reconfigurable network sort of naturally, uh, where each drone could be considered an element of the network. Uh, so you might imagine a, a whole set of drones that are communicating back and forth, and then uh, one node of your network drops out, so you need to reestablish coverage in this part of the node. And if you aren't using another part of the node, you can reconfigure it actually in space and then reestablish communication, um, which would be difficult to do in a fiber type network. Uh, this sort of uh, protocol with the drones hits this intermediate zone where we're not trying to hit 1,000 kilometers. And we're also not trying to hit the handheld regimes where you're on the order, you're less than a meter but you're in some sort of intermediate regime, like up to a kilometer is what we're going to be shooting for. So in order to do this, we kind of want to strip down everything we're doing with the protocols. We want to use a stripped down version of a source here that uh, uses uh, only three of the polarization states. In this case, we're using uh, the Y basis or the circular basis to encode the actual data and then using a single polarization from one of the uh, rectilinear bases, in this case, V. To uh, as a check basis. So one advantage of using RNL is that the drones are approximately going to be parallel to one another. So the polarization should be roughly aligned to one another. But to reduce the bit error rate, you can use a basis that's resistant to rotations, like the circular basis. And then you eliminate all the bit error due to relative rotations in that one basis. Uh, and then also, by uh, we can strip out some components from the receiver at the cost of some key, um, for reasons I'll explain later. But uh, if you sacrifice some of your key, you can reduce the amount of load you have to put on your receiver drone in terms of detector electronics. So what do we have to do to actually make this work? Um, I'm going to focus only on these top three things here. I'm going to talk about the actual platform. So what sorts of drones do you actually need to use to make this feasible? Uh, and then what do you need to put on the drone in order to actually close the link? So we heard a little bit just now about um, some pretty advanced uh, tracking technologies up in the space. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our efforts in developing um, those pointing stabilization technologies uh, between these drones. Um, the trouble with the drone is that the payloads need to be very small. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But that means that everything that you would do on a truck or something like that needs to be scaled way down and still function over a decent distance. Um, so therein lies the difficulty in a lot of, a lot of these uh, efforts. And then also, I'll talk a little bit about uh, developing the sources, um, which need to be high speed with no side channels while simultaneously being compact and vibration resistant. OK, so what do you actually need to put on a drone to make it uh, manipulatable? Uh, you typically have a large airframe. The one we're using here is about five uh, feet across. And it needs to be so big because we need a pretty huge payload. Uh, 
So this whole thing can at most be about 11 kilograms, but about half of that is used up by the body and the battery that goes on there. So we only have, uh, we'll say, four to six kilograms remaining. Um, what flies on there is this brain uh, flight controller that's responsible for the kinesthesia of the drone. So how it's oriented in space, it contains gyroscopes and things like that. And then also we have a computer that flies along that's responsible for doing classical communication and doing the stabilization and all the other parts of the, the protocol that we actually have to do. So the real work is kind of done in here. And uh, in more detail, uh, what you need to do to actually close a link between a transmitter and receiver. So these two boxes here are flying on the drone. Um, they're exactly the same with slightly more detail over here. Uh, you have your onboarded embedded computer, oh, sorry, onboard embedded computer, um, which needs to be as fast and small and as uh, power conservative as possible. And that interacts with the flight controller, telling the drone how to move to point towards its partner. And then you also need it to interact with the stabilization payload in order to know when you've achieved a lock and maintain that lock after you've achieved it. So there are some beacons traveling back and forth between the transmitter and receiver, and then identical payloads on the receiver. Um, you also need some way of locating those two drones in space. So for our testing purposes, we've been focusing on these indoor motion capture methods, but they naturally uh, extend to a high resolution GPS type location system when you move outside. So here I have a video of us uh, first doing our first tests of the position locking uh, indoors. So it's gonna go by pretty quickly, but I'll try to narrate as it's happening. So what you'll see is this drone is taken off manually over here, and then it will uh, become autonomous and then begin rotating towards its partner and become position locked in this room. And then here, this one becomes autonomous and points towards its partner. And then at this point, when they lock in position, then you would begin your secure link between uh, the two drones. So what's actually gonna fly on the drone to establish this link? So um, you, just, just as a focus on the transmitter side, uh, as a detail, um, we have a 635 nanometer source approximately. Uh, I'll go into more detail on that later. Um, but the, in here would be all of your polarization optics. Um, you'd also have a 980 nanometer beacon that's traveling out and mixed with a signal with a dichroic mirror. And then incoming from the channel is, in our case, a 520 nanometer uh, beacon, which is located on a quadrant cell detector, so it's an XY position locating detector. Um, the uh, tracking is established using the, these fast steering mirrors. Uh, in our case, they have about a 50 nano radian uh, precision, and that allows us to have pretty fine control over where those beams are going back and forth. So as a more broad view of the channel, so this is uh, the ad identical to what I just showed you on the previous slide. And then here's its twin on the receiver. Uh, we have the signal beam going through the free space channel and coming through a filter stack to some detection and analysis. Um, the steering mirrors here are controlled over a wireless link that's connected to the quadrant cell measurement from the FAR detector. So each drone measures the incoming beacon locally and then radios that information to the partner on the other side. So uh, these are some very early tests of the performance. So you can see that uh, there's for some minor perturbations on short time scales, so relatively low bandwidth perturbations so of uh, plus or minus point, uh, a quarter of a degree and then plus or minus a whole degree. Um, we can almost completely eliminate any of the dropouts that you would experience in the channel. Um, in this zoom in here, you see there's some oscillations from overcorrection from our PID feedback system, um, but relative to the correction that you get for the extreme uh, perturbation case, it's, it's negligible. Uh, so one thing to note is that uh, these perturbations are relatively slow, so it's uh, low bandwidth. What we found when we've actually run this with the drones in the air, we can achieve a lock for about six seconds. Um, between the drones, which is not quite enough to uh, begin the exchange of key material, but that's due to a bottleneck in the computation uh, that we're doing with our microcomputers on the drone. So with an upgrade in that system, uh, we should see the system begin to perform uh, significantly better for the, the flying platform. <coughs> 
OK, so just as a quick sidebar about sources, um, this is from the previous slide. What we really want from the sources is we need them to be indistinguishable and independent. Uh, we also need them to have a variable pulse height, as we've heard before, in order to do a decoy state type protocol. Uh, we need a short pulse width and a high, in order to enable a high repetition rate, um, because the channel loss is going to be significant, um, uh, you know, tens of dB. Uh, we need to try as many times to use the channel in order to get as much key material out as possible. And we also want the uh, bandwidth to be as narrow as possible in order to filter out as much of the sunlight background as we can, because the ultimate goal would be to fly these things during daylight. Uh, so a couple of candidates that are interesting uh, that are sort of on opposite sides of the spectrum, so to speak, are uh, something like a resonant cavity LED, which has the advantage of a wide spectrum that can be filtered in order to be made indistinguishable. So if you have multiple laser sources, you don't want to open a side channel by correlating their spectrum with their polarization. Um, so you can filter them down to ind indistinguishability. Uh, disadvantages are they're uh, relatively slow. They might have uh, around a three nanosecond rise time, which might limit your overall bandwidth. Um, but overall, a decent option. For this uh, presentation, though, I'm going to focus on uh, a extremely narrow bandwidth fiber laser that we've been looking at, narrow for a fiber laser. Uh, and this actually should be about less than 0 0.05, more like 0 0.01 nanometer bandwidth, which allows uh, for very tight filtering. Uh, just to go into a brief sidebar as well about the uh, source and receiver electronics. So these things need to actually fly on the drone. So they need to be lightweight, uh, and they also need to be able to drive all the lasers and uh, time tagging electronics uh, as well. So the same uh, board is used in both cases. Uh, so this sort of preliminary prototype is based on an off-the-shelf uh, Cyclone 5 FPGA uh, development board. Um, and that drives that fiber laser I showed on the previous page, uh, producing 500 picosecond width pulses at a 15 megahertz repetition rate for these tests, um, but can pulse up to a 200, 200 megahertz. Uh, so starting to get into a decent speed. Uh, the advantage of using an FPGA solution like this is that you can write whatever pattern you want onto it. So you, hypothetically, if you can string them up correctly, you can get any pattern of uh, decoy states that you would want. Uh, the receiver uh, right now is a two-channel proof of principle board um, that has a four nanosecond timing resolution, which uh, is uh, pretty good for something that is flying on a uh, platform. Um, and uh, we'll probably, uh, we're still investigating this, but we're going to work to uh, mount these uh, small um, form factor single photon counting modules onto uh, this uh, time tagging platform as well. So um, sort of the Mark II version of this would be extending this to a FPGA board that has eight six gigahertz high speed channels um, and further compactifying these detectors to be uh, suitable for flying on the receiver. Uh, so we have some preliminary tests of what uh, we should expect for a field test for our RRL uh, circular basis quantum bit error rate. Right now we see that's less than 2%. Um, and so that's considering a 400 kilohertz uh, count rate at the receiver uh, with a 15 megahertz pulse rate. Um, so that's about 0 0.02 photons received at the receiver. Although for this particular test, the filter stack we're using uh, cut everything down by about 10 dB. So uh, there's uh, probably more than one photon per pulse at the transmitter. Um, what we found is that by uh, armoring these fibers to the detectors with uh, aluminum tape and by using a tuned, carefully selected filter stack, we're able to get room light from about you would, what you see in this room right now, um, the background down to between 30 kilohertz and 100,000 kilohertz on each detector. Uh, which means that the quantum bit error rate introduced by that noise is relatively small. But when we go out in daylight, that will become a much more significant effect. Um, we expect that to, for the current beam width, which is about uh, a half a centimeter in diameter, uh, we expect, or sorry, a half an inch in diameter, 
we uh, expect this to not scale super well with the channel length, uh, going up to our dream target of a kilometer. But if we can improve some of our optics by uh, changing, out, changing some of the geometry, we can vastly improve the, the key rates out at uh, one kilometer. All right, so just to summarize, we've uh, managed to get our transmitter and receiver drones position locked uh, in an indoor testing facility. Um, we've gotten the wireless uh, two-way pointing and stabilization system working right now through uh, Wi-Fi feedback system, but ultimately through a 915 megahertz uh, radio. Uh, and then also we've demonstrated uh, flight-ready um, FPGA time tagger and FPGA transmitters, both of which have flown uh, on the drones. Um, in the future, we're going to get uh, close the link with uh, the stabilization and the position locking and the photon transmission and time tagging working at the same time. Um, and then from there, jump into uh, getting the full uh, three-state protocol working with the transmitter and receiver. And then refabricating everything, uh, possibly simultaneously with these other goals, using carbon fiber and printed plastics in order to reduce the payload and increase the amount of key material that you can transmit during the battery lifetime of the drone. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and welcome any questions you have.